afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this uh, webinar on the nursery uh, webinar series that we have been hosting. This is an initiative from the International Institute of Tropical Forestry, State and Private Forestry Unit, and it's part of the hurricane recovery efforts that we have been having several uh, activities, both in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, today's topic will be the management of pests and diseases. We have our uh, trainers here. Aramis will be introducing them in a, in a brief moment. And my dog is talking now, I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, just one additional announcement. ISA certified arborists who need to have uh, credit, CEU credit, you can do it by just filling out the post approval form or just let me know and I will send the form to you guys. But we won't be processing those directly from our office. So I want to introduce you to Aramis Garay. He's our training specialist and he has been the person that has been coordinating all these efforts. So Aramis, please. Hi, like Margaret mentioned, my name is Aramis Garay. I work with her and just as a reminder, um, this webinar will have been offered every Tuesday starting August 4 and ending on September 2 at 2 p.m. Atlantic Standard Time. This is Magali and my information in case you want to contact us and as a disclaimer, I would like to add that every webinar will be recorded and sent out as a in a lot email with all the necessary documents. Um, this is Diane Hasi and she is collaborating with us in the training. And this presenter is JB Friday and here is his information. Hi hey, JB. Good morning. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, we're ready to go. Yeah. And we have these together. Okay. So today we're going to be talking about insects, pests, and diseases. Uh, for this presentation, I've drawn heavily on information from some of my other colleagues in the Pacific. Uh, Mark Schmadick is an entomologist at the American Samoa Community College and Bob Schlub is a pathologist at the University of Guam. So these are two other people in our Pacific network of cooperative, of, um, cooperative extension. And um, I'm drawing on their expertise because Mark is an entomologist and Bob is a pathologist. And I'm just the forester trying to learn from them. What we really want to talk about today mostly is preventing pests and diseases. Now, and we're not going to get into pesticides at all. Um, those are other lectures for other things, but the first step um, in dealing with pests and diseases is to not get a disease, staying healthy. So we're going to focus on staying healthy, monitoring your plants so you know what is a healthy plant, and then keeping an eye out for pests and diseases. First part is growing a healthy plant. Now, um, so what is wrong? This is a so this presentation will have a lot of bad examples. I don't point out the nursery. Um, it's doing this bad examples, but I do like to um, I do like to use them as bad examples. What is wrong in the picture on the left? And you can type in the chat there. The picture on the right um, is a typical tropical nursery where they use field soil in poly bags, and that soil was so heavy. Yeah, very much compact soil. What the nursery in the left did is they added some coral sand to clay. And so what that makes is clay with grittiness on it. But when the irrigation system goes off, the water just sits in it. And you see how chlorotic everything is. The one on the right, that tree was just growing in a block of clay. Um, and you can see it didn't grow any roots, hardly any roots. It was a really unhealthy seedling. What else do you need to do? You need to um, don't water too much. And getting back to uh, Diane's presentation, but it needs to have, um, but it needs to have enough uh, fertilizer in it. Again, one mistake that we see when people move from field soil to using potting mixes, sometimes they forget to add fertilizer. And that's what happened in this nursery. Uh, that bright yellow chlorosis of the entire plant, that's because the poor seedlings had no fertilizer in it at all. On the flip side, if you have too much fertilizer, 
that will also um, it'll make the soil water too salty and it'll be trying to like grow a tree in the ocean it won't work and the tree can't pick it up you can monitor your electrical conductivity to see about that and then monitoring your pH of the medium keeping pests out you really there's really no good reason for you to be taking plants into your nursery and yet we see this a lot where people will bring a plant in in a nursery um, from the outside usually plants somewhere outside or once a plant's been out in the field it starts accumulating pests um, and then those pests will jump to your nursery bench so this is hibiscus it's covered with white flies we ask why are you growing this oh someone gave it to us um, so that's a bad reason I and I tend to be pretty bloody minded about plants if I see a sick plant I'd rather just throw it out and keep the nursery clean and not try to um, but definitely this bringing in plants to the nursery there's no good reason to do that um, yes if you have a propagation facility that is growing plants for you that's one thing but just donated plants to the nursery that's a bad idea so keeping pests out of the nursery is an important thing how do we do that um, there are you know good clean practices for the nurseries um, special practices for things that are um, particular pests in the area um, the picture on the left is a nursery bench in a place that had a lot of ant problems so what they did is they put the feet of the um, nursery bench in soapy water so the ants couldn't crawl up and onto the nursery bench um, I've also seen the feet in an area and I think this was for slugs they used water softener pellets so a slug couldn't crawl up onto the nursery bench from that um, copper bands is another thing that I've seen to keep slugs off a uh, nursery bench and this is a nursery in a wet forest where there are just slugs everywhere so the nursery manager put copper bands around the legs and you can buy these at garden shops to keep slugs from coming up and then lightweight screening this is um, the guy in the red hat is at the universe uh, I'm sorry is Guam forestry and he's growing a rare tree which um, is super susceptible to a lepidopteran pest and so the the moth comes in and lays lays eggs on the trees and then the caterpillar just wipes them out so he keeps them on a fine screen thing um, mis amigos de Puerto Rico tenemos también aquí coqui frogs aquí en Hawaii desde hace 15 años y aquí en Hawaii lo siento pero son pestes aquí so the problem with coqui frogs we got coqui frogs here thank you Puerto Rico about 15 years ago um, and they move with nursery plants they'll invade a nursery the frogs lay eggs in pots and then when people buy the plants they bring the coquis with them uh, people in Hawaii they think they're really noisy I know Puerto Ricans love coquis uh, but they're a new thing for us and they're really noisy so nurseries get blacklisted if it's known that they have coquis frogs in their nursery so actually the nurse this nursery or this picture was um, certified to be cokey free because people didn't want to buy nurseries and get cokey frogs um, with the nurseries so again keeping pests out of your nursery is really important um, let, let me say also it's probably more important if you're doing restoration of native areas where you don't have a pest in that area the worst thing you can do is uh, bring a new pest up into a pristine environment it's probably less important if it's in an environment that the pest is already common already um, so where I live there are deafening levels of cokey frogs if I brought home another cokey frog it wouldn't make a difference um, if we brought it to a new island that would be a huge difference then removing sick plants and again these are a couple bad nursery examples of sick plants that were grown in the nursery um, that were there the plants on the left are actually sandalwoods um, they grew them without any plan and this harkens back to our target tree nursery um, you should be able to walk through your nursery and point to every bench of trees and say these trees are grown for this project or these trees are going for this and when this project happens they'll be out of here and go into that project um, the trees on the left were grown because someone got seeds and they've been sitting there in the nursery I was surprised that I saw a photo 
from a year previously and the same seedlings were there. They didn't have any reason to grow them, they just had seeds so they grew them and then they just sat there and they get sicker and sicker and accumulate diseases. The ones on the right are uh, the native Pacific Island Califylum um, and they have a thrips on them. So you see how all the the leaves on the thrips are, uh, the leaves on the trees are all curled up with those thrips and it's just a reservoir for pests. And again, since there's no reason for, they don't, they didn't have any plan to use those, they should just get rid of those. So getting rid of sick and diseased plants is, is a key thing. And you know, if you, if these are super rare plants that you won't be able to get any more seed, maybe nurse them along, but almost always it's better to grow new plants than to try to nurse sick seedlings back in. Cleaning up weeds, just in general, keep your nursery clean. The nursery on the left, these things have been in the poly bags way too long, full of weeds. The nursery on the right, is, um, they put down weed cloth, but then they never pulled the weeds up in it. So you're, you're walking through that nursery, stirring up, and the, the weeds are full of insects. The insects are jumping right up onto the benches there. And so, uh, yeah, keeping a nursery clean. Um, in a seasonal nursery, for example, the nurseries in Guam, they clean them out once a season because they plant their plants in the rainy season, then they clean the nursery carefully, and they start with fresh plants in the, uh, in the dry season to plant out the next rainy season. So this cycle um, really helps them uh, keep the nursery clean. The nursery on the right is in a wet climate, so you can plant any time of the year, so they're continuous plants in the nursery, so they don't have any time where, for example, they could herbicide all the weeds because there's always plants in that nursery. Monitoring pests. This is, oh, this is, by the way, the, 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 the white guy there is Mark Schmadek. This is in the nursery in American Samoa. Uh, so Mark is showing the foresters there, uh, or the nursery managers, how to look underside the leaves with it. Now, in our last nursery workshop when we were there, we gave everybody one of these little um, 10 times um, hand lenses. Really useful. You can get one for 20 bucks on Amazon. Um, but a lot of the pests are going to be small enough that that little hand lens, and if you ever meet an entomologist, they always have a hand lens on their keychain because they're always looking at these tiny little pests with that. But you have to bend over and look under the leaf. And I really like the picture of the big Samoan guy bending over and looking under it because I know. As a forester, I tend to stand up and walk through the nursery and look down at the plants and they look good. What I noticed the entomologist does is he immediately starts turning over the leaves and looking for those pests that are hiding under the leaves and he always has a hand lens with him. So those are a couple of things I learned from the entomologist. Use your hand lens, turn over the leaves and look for them. What are you looking for? Um, what do you look? You look at the growing tips of seedlings. So these scales here, um, the, you can see those are right on the growing tip of a seedling. These aphids here, that's the new leaf coming out. The new leaf and the growing tips are things that you're going to get attacked. And again, you see how the aphids are on the underside. Um, the scale, oh, and the scale, can we see here? I don't know if you can see here. You see there's ants right there on the scale. So ants are a warning if you see ants, it's a warning because often ants in a nursery will be tending scales, they will be tending white flies, they will be tending aphids. So the ants aren't doing any damage to the plant. The ants are tending these various sucking insects that are attacking the plant. Check the top of the leaves, but turn the leaves over and check underside the leaves as well. What are you looking for? Different leaf damages and eventually you will get to know what damages are characteristic of what um, is going on. For example, usually a caterpillar damage, I can make this clarify, let me move it. Usually a caterpillar damage will be this uh, chewing away of the edges of things. Caterpillars typically chew around the edges of leaves. Leaf miners or something else, you see these little trails on the leaf miners. Specks are often mites or something very small on that. Look for damage to the leaf, look for discoloration. For example, this here, this damage here on our native myoporum is a thrips. Um, it's really hard to see the insect. I'll show you a picture later. The insect is only two millimeters long, but you see the, what it causes. You see that damage, uh, that sort of galling, because the thrips causes a gall. 
on it. So um, you'll notice that pest by the damage that it causes. Things to look out for, look at the growing tip. So um, you see what happened here? That spread fruit grew up and something killed the tip. And you can tell that even looking at this much older plant because then there's one shoot and it grew up and what do you know, it happened again, something killed the tip. So go into that nursery and you'll see something is killing the tip on those breadfruits. And I'll show you later what it is. But when you see this pattern of growth of a, a seedling shoots up and then it moves again, it moves again, that's a, a tip borer of some sort that you've got there. Other things to look for is look for webbing uh, of insects there. Look for slime trails. Um, slugs and snails typically will come out at night, but you come in in the morning and you see those slime trails where they've been. Um, although if you can, it's a good idea to go out to your nursery at night and see what's crawling around your nursery at night. Uh, with us, with the koki frogs, if you go into the nursery in the daytime, you don't hear anything, but you have to go there at night. So um, one of the bigger distributors of kokis was Walmart. They had a garden center out back and the garden center was just full of coqui. If you went there at night, it was deafening. If you went there in the day, you didn't hear anything. People would bring plants and they'd bring them home with the coquis. Check for frass. I mean, that's a caterpillar. The caterpillars leave poop all over the place. So there's frass uh, that you see on that. Sooty mold. Now, what sooty mold is, sooty, people think sooty mold is a pest, a very common um, thing that you see on plants. These are on trees. Sorry, I didn't have a picture of this on a, in the nursery. Um, but sooty mold happens when you have some sort of sucking insect, like these scales here on the breadfruit. So there's an ant. You see there's the ant tending the scale. But there's the scale insect there. So the scales are living by sucking the sap out of the tree. Scales are protein limited. So to get a balanced diet, they excrete a lot of the um, sugar to get enough protein to live on, to get their balanced protein and carbohydrates in their diet. When they excrete the sugar, basically they're, they're pooping out sugar water and it's landing on the leaf below them. And then the sugar water molds. So you can wipe off sooty mold. The mold isn't the pathogen. It does interfere with photosynthesis of a tree. But the mold itself, so like what you see here, this black mold, it's not the pathogen. The problem is the scales. Um, so when you see the mold, it's a sign you've got some kind of scale or aphid or something on your trees. And you, you have to deal with that by dealing with the, um, the, the pest. Sometimes you can deal with that by controlling the ants. Uh, so sometimes you get. There are enough natural predators that will take care of the scales if you control the ants. So I've had success controlling sooty mold by using ant bait. And you bait for the ants. And if the ants go away, then the other natural control uh, predator insects will take care of the scales. Monitoring pests. Um, so this is a nursery that has yellow sticky cups. For reasons I don't know, insects are attracted to yellow. So you will see um, nurseries sometimes will hang a yellow card or a yellow cup covered with sticky stuff. And so insects are attracted to that. And that's an easy way, a quick way, just to um, see what is flying around your nursery. Uh, that's Dr. Aubrey Moore. He's the extension entomologist at University of Guam. And again, he's, um, He's great, he knows a lot, and he's really good at seeing very tiny things that we foresters who see whole trees um, often aren't seeing those tiny little insects the way an entomologist is. Now, one of the things that I always do at nurseries, and I'm afraid this frustrates some of the people with whom I work, is I pull seedlings out of their containers to check the root development. Um, so the seedling on the right is grown in a dibble tube. So it's easy just to slide it out, check the roots, slide it back in. But this seedling had a lot of root rot on it. So probably they were overwatering the seedling. So you can see the roots here are kind of brown looking. You know, this, this light color would be a healthy root. This brown looking root down here, that's root rot. So you slide, the seedling itself looked OK. But when you examine the roots, you said, oh, that's getting a little too much water. We better back off on our watering. It's a good thing to be able to check roots. The seedling on the right, 
was in a poly bag. So again, with a poly bags, you can't just slide them out easily. So I said, let's let's look at one of these seedlings. So we broke open the poly bag, we washed the roots out, and there was a pathetic amount of roots on that. There's almost no roots growing on that. I say, look, you don't have good root development. Why? Probably because you're growing them in clay. But you really know a lot. Sacrifice a couple seedlings. You should be growing thousands or hundreds of thousands of seedlings. Again, your rare plant, maybe not. But for your routine seedlings, sacrifice a couple, take them out of the pots, wash the roots off, look how you're doing on it. You know, really, when you're growing something out plant, it's not the leaves and the stem that you want. To, you want the good roots on it. Other things to look out for, so typically uh, aphids on tips or on the leaf things. Here's a psyllid. Psyllids are another kind of sucking insect, uh, but they fly around, and then they suck uh, out of growing tips. Um, very common, different kinds of scales. So this is a green scale. Again, you have to turn the leaf over. But again, the way you find the green scale is you notice sooty mold. Then you turn the leaf over, and you see these tiny little scales. I wish I had uh, an actual scale so you can see how big they were in the picture. Um, mealy bugs, really common. This was another kind of scale that we saw in the Yap nursery on one of their rare trees. Um, a white soft body scale on them. So really common things in nurseries and these are things that first of all you want to keep them out, second control the ants can help control that, or third they can be, some of these can be pretty easily controlled with um, even soap, you know natural pesticides such as soap. Shoot borers, this gets back to the the shoot borer um, issue on yap. Um, so what they noticed, they noticed the shoots dying of the trees, then they noticed right there at the growing point, if you look right here, there was this mass of kind of foam break into it, and what do you know, there's a shoot borer. So this is a, a, a Lepidopteran, this is a moth, and it actually was a new record for the island. Uh, so they worked with their Department of Agriculture and they established a new record. Um, and what they were doing, the nursery was growing out, these were tissue culture plants, uh, sent from the mainland U.S. to Yap, and they were going to distribute them to some of the outer islands because Yap State serves not only their island, but some very small islands that are hundreds of miles away in the Pacific Ocean. But the foresters decided they didn't want to send breadfruit out because they didn't want to send out this pest. Um, and they said, the worst thing we can do is introduce a new pest to this island. That island had been hit by a typhoon, and they lost a lot of their breadfruit, which is one of their main staple crops. Um, but again because the pest was in there in the nursery and it turns out that the pest is really common on a breadfruit tree that is on the nursery grounds and if I were the nursery manager I would cut that tree down uh, but they haven't done it so um, again keeping your nursery clean by keeping pests away from it but kudos to the app foresters who noticed a new pest got it identified and then did not send it out to another island I don't know how many of you all send seedlings to different islands. I know in the Virgin Islands you have a set of islands and I'm guessing, so if anybody's on from the Virgin Islands, do you have pests that are on some islands or not, or even Puerto Rico, do you send seedlings out to Culebra and Vieques, and is that a concern that you would send a pest from the main island to Culebra, Vieques, or um, that little goat island off to the west of Puerto Rico? And in, in Virgin Islands, you definitely have several major islands, and it could be a concern about moving pests between islands. Thrips. Thrips are so small that you don't see them unless you're looking for them. Um, so this is a, a, a new pest for us, the myoporum thrips, but it's only two millimeters long. Uh, so you really need to cut the plant open with, and look for a hand lens to find them. Caterpillars, you can tell again by webbing. You can usually tell them because the leaves are chewed from the edges. This is a, a typical, um, on our native cordia out here, it has a, a pest. Uh, and and I, let me point out that it's um, it's a non-native pest that arrived here about 100 years ago, but really whacks our native cordia. Uh, and then some caterpillars are also minor. So you see the minor, that means it goes inside the leaf tissue. Yeah, sending trees island to island can be really bad if you send pests with them. Another pest way of here, um, I know what this is called, broca, broca en español. Uh, hay un broca de café 
hay un broca de semilla de café, hay también un broca de, uh, de ramas de café. So this is a, a twig borer, which for us is a, a serious pest of coffee, um, but it also gets in our native acacia. Um, in a growing tree, it usually will only attack a narrow twig. So if you see everything distal, that means everything beyond the point, it dies. And you go back along the twig, and you see there the little hole where it goes in. So ambrosia beetles, there's a whole lot of the different ones. Um, but this is a twig borer one that's a really common pest. What it will do is it'll kill a seedling, or again, it's one of those ones that will, um, the seedling will die down to a point and then shoot out below that. And if you look carefully on the seedling, you'll see a little hole the size of a pencil lead. Slugs and snails, again, are important pests, and you'll see them at night coming out. Um, you may have to turn pots over to look for them underneath and look for them, but again, they're something you really don't want to ship around. Now, we also have beneficials. Um, so spiders, um, praying mantis are beneficial. Ladybugs, so all these coccinellids, uh, we don't have any native ladybugs or ladybug beetles, the coccinellid beetles here, but we have dozens that were introduced for biocontrol. So typically, back in the day, those were introduced for biocontrol, but they really like to eat aphids and stuff like that. So in this picture here, uh, the little yellow guys here are a psyllid, and uh, the ladybugs are a biocontrol for the psyllid, so they're eating the psyllid. Uh, so they're good things. So this is a an argument to trying to work with nature um, rather than just hitting everything with a pesticide, because the pesticide will kill your predators. And in fact, you can make things worse um, by overapplying pesticides, killing all your predators off, and then your pest might explode in population. So uh, be careful with that. <laughs> Okay, so prevention, natural enemies, manual removal, like the, for example, that picture I showed you earlier with the caterpillars on the rare plants, he only has 20 of them uh, because they're very rare. So he's going through and picking them off. If, if you only got 20 plants on the bench, you can go through and pick them off. And then, yes, definitely pesticides have their uses, uh, and we're not really talking about use of pesticides now, but that's the last thing, not the first thing. You don't go growing sickly plants and then blasting them with a pesticide, start with healthy plants. Be very careful moving plants around the islands. It is very easy to move uh, things. Do people move plants between Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands? Um, that is another way to move things around. And then people just bringing things home. Um, this is a huge pest that uh, I know we really suffer from it in Hawaii. Uh, it went from Hawaii to Guam. It went from Guam to Yap. Uh, we don't know who's next on it, but it is um, a tiny, tiny ant, little fire ant, Wasmania. Um, you see how small they are on the size of a pencil. These things, you don't even see them. They're so small. They're light colored. You don't notice them till they go down the back of your neck and sting, and they hurt, they hurt, they hurt. Oh, yeah, plants coming in from Florida, absolutely for sure. Uh, a really good Florida has a lot of pests. Florida sends us stuff. I can imagine how much they stuff they send you. And we send stuff to Guam, and then Guam sends stuff out to the small islands there. So um, really be conscientious that you don't send pests to other things. The way these ants move around is people moving around plants. Um, on Yap, they know who brought them because someone brought a bunch of plants back from Guam to landscape their house and they came in with ants on them. Um, so do the right thing. Don't move plants around with pests. Another pest that we have is the coconut rhinoceros beetle. I don't know if you all have that in the Caribbean. Um, this is a very large beetle. It's native to Philippines. Um, but there's a, um, for reasons, it is exploding in the Pacific and in Guam. It has killed about half of the coconut trees on the island now. It makes these very characteristic V-shaped cuts on it, uh, but it has moved island to island, um, and it's been very difficult to control. In Hawaii, we've spent uh, the past seven years trying to wipe it out. So far, it's only on one island, and again, we have um, 
eight islands in Hawaii, and it's only got one of them, one island so far, but it's very easy to move it around in mulch. And this is something, if I were king of Hawaii, I would forbid anybody from moving mulch between islands. But there are commercial mulch plants on Oahu that create mulch and ship it island to island. That would be a great way to move a pest. Um, I would put a stop to that if I were king, but I'm not. So be very careful moving these things. Yeah, one pest coming in per year from Florida. We get, I forget offhand what the number is. In Hawaii, I think we get 17 new insects established every year. Uh, and a lot of those, not all. I mean, there are things that come in in pallets uh, or whatever, but a lot of them are imported plants because we get the stuff from, not so much from Florida, but from California. All right, moving to diseases. Um, concept, the key concept in plant pathology is um, the disease triangle. To have a disease, and I'm talking about a biotic disease, a disease caused by a pathogen, you have to have three things. You have to have the pathogen, which is what we normally think of. Okay, this fungus is causing this disease. You have to have a host, and as we know, some plants are susceptible to a disease and other plants, even other cultivars, might not be. But third is you have to have an environment that allows the disease to happen. So usually, if you get rid of any one of these things, you don't get disease. Obviously, if you get rid of the pathogen, if you can spray a fungicide and it kills the fungus, that would get rid of the disease. If you change your host, say you have a, a cultivar which is resistant versus susceptible to disease, then you can get rid of it. For example, in coffee cultivation, there are rootstocks that are nematode resistant. So our coffee industry is moving from growing um, seedlings to growing uh, grafted plants that are on resistant rootstocks. So you have your cultivar that you want to eat on the scion, but the rootstock is a disease resistant one. The third thing, the thing you really control in the nursery is the environment. And this gets back to how much you're watering, how wet it is, how well aerated it is, all those things. And that's also something very much that you can control in the nursery. In the field, not so much. Once the trees are planted out in the field, it's, you know, it's there, they got to survive. But you can control the environment in the nursery. Another concept is that native pests and pathogens on the native plants usually are not a problem. Well, uh, Hiram mentioned monocropping. When you're monocropping a large area, you've just created a huge amount of host of whatever that pest or pathogen is that really likes that. Um, that's something that I'm kind of agonizing about, about our native acacia, that now that people are putting in hundreds of acres of it, whereas normally in the forest it's very common, but it's in a mixed forest. So the pests may not move so much, but when we see acres planted, the pests will really take off because they just have this continuous field of the same thing to attack. Um, on the other hand, mixed species silviculture is really difficult in the forest, so a whole other topic. Um, back to native things. So this is a native gall insect on our native Metrociterus. It's there. It may look ugly, but the plant is adapted to it. It's not killing anything. It's just part of nature. Um, this is a native rust on our native acacia. It's bad news if you have a seedling that gets the rust. Uh, it'll, it'll knock the seedling back until the seedling isn't growing anything. But it's there in the field. There's always going to be some rust in some areas. It's not something that the manager has to worry about. What is devastating is when you get a new pest or new pathogen into your environment. Um, because the plants have no resistance to that. Um, and so it can just wipe it out. So this is a thrips on our native myoporum. Um, and it has killed maybe half, two-thirds of the myoporum on our island. Um, really, uh, it uh, comes from Tasmania, but it came here via the landscaping trade. It came in on landscaping plants that people brought in, jumped to the native ones, and is just devastating them. This is a pathogen. This is a rust fungus that attacks uh, Myrtaceae. Um, it's in the Caribbean, but it doesn't seem to be a huge problem in the Caribbean just because it's... Um, it's uh, not attacking anything that you guys really treasure, but for us, um, it's really hitting some things that we really treasure, and it's causing a huge, um, very noticeable impact on the forest. So non-native, new pests and pathogens 
can be really devastating. Back to moisture, this is the thing that you're going to control most in your environment is, is the moisture, how much moisture you're going to get, as far as at least fungus goes. Um, spore production, germination of spores, and then dispersal of spores is all facilitated by water. So managing the amount of water is the best thing you can do for your um, nursery as far as managing fungal pathogens. Diseases again, um, if you see different things, um, if you see a leaf spot that could be fungi or bacteria or it could be something abiotic, it could be a virus. Wilt is usually going to be a fungal sort of thing causing things to wilt, uh, but it could be nematodes also. And then root rots, uh, yellowing, yellowing for example um, is largely going to be a nutrient deficiency, so it's not going to be a pathogen at all. I should mention that these things do interact. So um, if you have a seedling that is really nutrient deficient, you may start finding pathogens on it too because it's weak, it's not outgrowing the pathogens, or it's not defending itself against the pathogens. But the cure isn't to try to kill the pathogen, the cure is to give it enough fertilizer so it has enough nutrients. So back to that growing healthy plant. Damping off is really common in the nursery. Uh, this you'll, you'll see the seedlings right at the soil line bending over. Usually that's a fungal, a pythium or something like that, a fungal pathogen on it. Um, and, and again, pythium is usually ubiquitous in the environment. Um, you do want sterile clean medium. Um, reusing medium that is contaminated with fungal pathogens is, is a problem. So fresh, clean, sterile medium is one way, but not overwatering it is the other way to really avoid too much damping off. Leaf spots, uh, different fungal pathogens. This is uh, here uh, a rust pathogen on uh, syzygiums. I think you have some syzygiums in, in your islands. Uh, another leaf spot pathogen here. Root rots, getting back, so there's the fungi on that. On this pant here, uh, this is a, a native piper. I don't know if you have any pipers. Uh, but anyway, root not nematodes. You see the, the deformation of all the roots there. Uh, nematodes are a real problem with certain things. Coffee. Coffee has uh, a lot, at least for us. I don't know about for you there, but I assume you would because we do. We have a lot of problems with coffee nematodes. And again, what they do with the coffee nematodes is grafting good quality scions onto nematode resistant rootstocks. The nematode resistant rootstocks aren't particularly good coffee, so they have to graft onto them. I should get a, a picture of coffee for that slide. Nutrient deficient, so yellowing. Yellowing can be different things. So on the bottom left, this is a, a fungal wilt. Uh, so this is actually a trial of a fungal wilt. These seedlings were inoculated with a fungal pathogen with a fusarium. These are our native acacia. Um, they were inoculated with a fusarium in a disease resistant trial. And so this uh, symptom here of the yellow leaves, that is um, the fungal pathogen has gotten into the stem and it, it's starting to turn yellow. It's its first sign and that thing will wilt, it'll drop its leaves. These guys over here, the nursery manager went to our workshop. He said, I'm going to grow trees and dibble tubes. He went and he bought some, made a potting mix of peat moss and perlite, planted the things up, and they turned bright yellow. And he hadn't added any fertilizer to it because he had always grown in soil. Good topsoil has a lot of nutrients for the trees. It never was a problem. And then he didn't know why his trees all turned yellow, but this is just a nutrient deficiency there. I threw this slide in. Um, this is important for us in the Pacific. Uh, I don't know if it's a, if you have diseases like this, and this is kind of a field disease, but um, we're having in the Western Pacific a lot of problems with a fungal disease, Philinus noxious, um, and it's attacking breadfruit. And for the Pacific Islands, I, I mean, I fondly remember eating um, fried breadfruit and fish in Puerto Rico. But in the, the, the Western Pacific Islands, that's really people's day-to-day -day food is the breadfruit. Um, and so this is a fungus that's attacking the breadfruit. 
I don't know, this may not be important at all for you all, but it's important for them to recognize. Other symptoms, um, herbicide damage. Herbicides, a lot of herbicides are mimic plant hormonal activity. And so what it does is it just messes up how the plant grows. If it's the right dosage, it messes it up enough the tree dies. If it's a very little dosage, the tree will flush out in this dwarf, this weird dwarf kind of foliage. Um, so this is a, a seedling in a restoration area where they had been spraying between the rows with glyphosate. And so this sort of weird um, growth here is an herbicide damage. So you often see that. We also see that in coffee. We see that in our coffee farms because for us they spray between the rows with herbicide. Uh, the non-organic guys do at least. And if they're not careful, drift will come up on the coffee. You'll see this weird flushing. Um, how do you diagnose it? I mean, you look around, you say, hey, was the guy spraying herbicide? You ask the people, were you spraying herbicide? Bingo, there's your systems on that. Um, but again, or do you see symptoms of nutritional deficiencies? Ask the growers, uh, what are they doing? Uh, copper paints to control what, Hiram? OK, quiz. Uh, you walk into a nursery, um, and this is a mahogany seedling, and it's wilting. What could be wrong? What could be wrong, and what would you do? I, I go into nurseries. Oh, the sock disease. I don't know about copper paints for sock disease. Let me get back to you on that. What they do is they just scrape the fungus off, but if the tree's far gone, they fell it and burn it to stop it from spreading to other trees. It spreads pretty slowly. But what would you do, I, I get this, stump the forester, I walk into nursery, say, hey, what's wrong with this tree, and lift it up. How would you diagnose this? I'll give you a minute to type something in. OK. Um, Elaine typed in too much or too little water. So the leaves, so the leaves, those green leaves, they're still green. So it doesn't look like there's a pathogen on the leaf. Nothing ate the leaf. It just looks like it wilted. Um, why would it wilt? There's no water getting to the leaves. But Elaine's a step ahead um, is saying um, it's got either too much or too little water. So the first thing you do, obviously, is you pick it up. Is the pot heavy or is it light? If it's light, maybe it's at the edge of the bench. And remember that diagram of how a sprinkler system doesn't get at the edge of the benches? Look, is it at the edge of the bench? Is it light? Pick up other pots on the bench. If this one's light and the other ones are heavy, problem solved. It's not getting water from the sprinkler. This pot was heavy. OK, it's heavy. I picked it up. It's got a lot of water in it. What's going on now? So Michael said hydrophobic soils. Yes. If it's a potting mix that dried out and then didn't get wetted, so if that's dry peat moss and you pour water on top of dry peat moss, what happens? The water runs off. So that could be, it could have been dried out and then not getting any water. But then it would be light. So I picked up this one. It was heavy. OK, it's heavy. Then it's got too much water, and you've got root rots on that. Removing your medium and check for fungal growth. So we did that. We opened it up. It was in a clay medium. Um, and so that medium encouraged fungal growth, and that's what was doing on this one. So what we did on this is, where am I? So it's wilting. Is it light? If it's light, it's not getting water. If it's heavy, it was too wet, and it had root rots on it. Or it could be too salty, so it could be too much fertilizer also. Um, if you over-fertilize something, the water's too salty, and you're like trying to water it with salt water. That was another one. And this, this had root rots. Um, Gabriel said adding more soil organic, adding more organic matter, absolutely. To a clay soil, if you had some sort of compost or organic matter, it would make a lighter, a lighter uh, medium on that. Um, and the medium, it, it, as a bunch of you have pointed out now, look at the medium to diagnose what's going on with that. OK, so summary, preventing plant diseases. So prevent the pest problems, keep the pests out, um, get rid of the ones that are there, and growing a healthy plant so you're not fighting off with all the diseases for them. Um, and keeping a healthy nursery environment. Uh, 
use fresh potting mix because that's that will often be contaminated with pathogens on it. Don't overwater things. Um, and get rid of old disease plants in the nursery. This has been one of the hardest things for nursery managers to do is just get rid of the old uh, diseased plants and start with fresh plants um, using good planting material. I mean, what I like to say is if you're cooking dinner for your family, you know, you would want to use fresh ingredients. You don't want to use a fish that's been sitting in the fridge for, you know, a week and kind of smells bad already. You get rid of that. And the same for a forestry project. I hate seeing projects that go out there and they're using year old seedlings that are pot bound and they do all that work to plant it and then it never flourishes. So you want good ingredients to your project. Don't let things build up. And then learn to recognize the pests that are common in your nursery and learn to recognize the um, beneficials. And then this is what we need to tell Florida and California, but stop sending new pests to the islands. But uh, those of us in the islands can also be like our colleagues on YAP and keep an eye out so we don't ship um, seedlings with pests to other islands. Um, a couple resources for you. Um, again, the Tropical Nursery Manual, uh, Chapter 14, is the chapter on pest management and that. And if you go to the Ringer website, you can download the, the manual chapter by chapter, or Diane said she would be happy to send you ones. Um, often it's nice to just have that physical manual there that you can you go for. Um, I am working on developing a library of images of pests and diseases. Um, for example, that's cottony cushion scale. That's something that was affecting one of our, our native uh, erythrina. They had a, quite an outbreak on our native erythrina this year, uh, cottony cushion scale there. So that's that to the album. Um, Georgia, now that I think about it, Georgia, the bug net, bugwood network. Let me type that in. I don't know if anybody uses the Bugwood network. Uh, can you type in the link for it there? Uh, they have an excellent collection of pests and diseases, although probably mostly not tropical. Um, then one of the things I was um, thinking about, I am very fortunate that in my building we have um, someone who's a plant diagnostician. And um, so one of our services with Cooperative Extension um, there you go. One of our services with Cooperative Extension is to diagnose pests and diseases for farmers. Um, so I looked up, do you have those in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands? And uh, it seems that you do. Even uh, UPR even has a Clinica de Plantas. Um, they have an office in Rio Piedras and an office in Mayagüez um, for bringing plants in. So um, for those of you in Puerto Rico, do you use that service? Do you bring in uh, plants? It's, it's very common. We have a lot of nursery industry on this island to see the growers lining up at the door, bringing in plants for diagnosis. Um, and then, um, excellent, excellent. And in the Virgin Islands, uh, they did have some, some uh, at least someone who did diagnostics with the University of Virgin Islands. Um, anyway, it's been really useful because these that's someone who really um, knows this thing. So it's good for a nursery operator to know the common things, but um, if you're stumped on something. And I know our diagnostician does, does always circle back to how you manage your environment to minimize. He will give you what recommended insecticides or what recommended fungicides they are, but also he note, if he notices the um, medium is too wet or the medium has too much clay or you have the seedlings packed together too closely on your bench or whatever, um, he will give those kind of recommendations also. Very good. Uh, so we're getting some uh, good comments in the chat on who the uh, plant pathologists, the entomologists are. Um, oh, so there's some grant to visit and do pest and disease management on that. So that that's great because really uh, it's great to have the entomologists really out there looking because they will know that. And also if you have a network going and you can be aware if there is a new pest, um, moving around the island, it's really good to know what it is uh, to keep it out. Um, in the Virgin Islands, does William Cherub, Cherubin, um, does he do diagnoses though? You could bring in stuff and he could say, yeah, this is this, this is this. Yeah. 
And Amy, where are you? Sorry. Thank you. So, so, so you do have a pest management with cooperative extension there. Excellent. Yeah, I, I, I looked through uh, the cooperative extension. Uh, I looked for the websites of the cooperative extension at, at UPR and University of the Virgin Islands, uh, and so I, I could see that uh, you do have some of those services there. Is it a fee for service here? It's a fee, but it's really cheap. Uh, insect diagnosis is seven dollars, uh, and plant disease is twelve dollars. So it's really worthwhile. Um, bringing your things in for diagnosis um, that you just have to make an appointment and get them in and get an in thing and, and, and wow no fee in the Virgin Islands we, we charge a nominal fee and even then the growers tried to get away from it but uh, it's, it's really worthwhile getting that advice all right um, that is uh, the end of this talk are there any other questions um, and, and, and very much appreciate the um, input those of you, you should be looking at the chat um, and some discussion from some people as to local help with plant pest uh, diagnoses um, yeah the insect diagnosis you know one of the things that we're going to hear or um, is happening organically is uh, social media groups I find it works much better for um, pests like insects than diseases it's easy enough for someone with a cell phone to take a picture of an insect and post it um, of course the internet you can get anything but we have uh, a um, Hawaii insect Facebook page and people from Department of Agriculture are on that and someone will take a picture of something and the people from the Department of Ag will say yep that's this that's this and once in a while they'll say we've never seen that get us a specimen so we can idea it out so you know again the way things are working for um, things uh, low-tech pesticide soap and oil yes soap and oil uh, soap and oil mixes um, you know the best I could do is uh, I have a recipe here that we use but I, I don't have it with me at the at the moment uh, go on the web uh, and just some sort of uh, soap oil mixture uh, and that's our like our first line of defense for things that you can use that for and that's um, a, a, a soap oil mixture the other thing I've been noticing is that we have at our college um, let me see if I can post the list for this our college extension um, has a couple hundred publications on pests and diseases and so when someone will post something, someone will often post just the link. Yeah, here's the manual on it. Um, now, I don't know how common what we have is also in Puerto Rico. I'm sure some of it is, and some of it is very different. Let me get you a link for that. I will get you a link for that yeah neem oil again neem itself is um, an insect growth regulator so that's a way of, of controlling insects also so there's a link on our University of Hawaii um, insect pests and our publications on plant diseases and um, some of these will be similar for a lot of what you grow and some of these you know plumeria and coffee it'll be similar other things will be different okay any other questions All right, thank you all for attending. Um, next week, uh, we'll be closing with uh, outplanting, so getting the trees out into the field, managing the site for outplanting. Um, and that, that, that final step, uh, and again, thinking your job isn't done when the 
tree leaves, your job is done when the tree's in the ground and growing. So aloha and have a good week, everybody. Thanks, JB. Um, thanks, everyone, to joining in to our fifth nursery webinar series. I will um, send you all the information as a follow-up email. And see you guys next Tuesday, September 8th at 2 p.m. for our final webinar. Eh, gracias a todos los participantes por dar su cita hoy con nosotros. Eh, gracias a JB Friday. Eh, estaré dándole, enviándole toda la información a través de un email de seguimiento a las personas que se registraron a este webinar. Y nos vemos el martes 8 de septiembre en nuestro webinar final. Muchas gracias.